Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on the 6th of September. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information, and you can do that easily with the National Weather Service's tools and phone numbers. 1-800-472-0391 is your Alaska weather information line. Use that, write it down, and then as you're calling in, write down the numbers that you're getting and pushing into the phone, and you can simply refer back to that quickly next time without having to listen to the prompts and get through your forecast information a whole lot faster. Of course, our main webpage is weather.gov slash Alaska. If you'd like, you can start out a little bit closer to home. Weather.gov slash Juneau, weather.gov slash Anchorage, or weather.gov slash Fairbanks will localize your starting page a little bit more and might have some more relevant information to ongoing weather situations in your part of the 49th state rather than looking at the entire statewide view, which is totally fine. But if you'd like to get a little bit closer to home, that's one way to do it. Of course, from this webpage, you can jump off to Alaska Aviation Weather Forecast, the Alaska Pacific River Forecast information. Uh, the National Tsunami Warning Center, of course, has the most recent earthquake events around Alaska. If you'd like to check up on that and any impacts and learn about how you and your family can stay tsunami ready all year long. And if you can't find what you're looking for, please do let me know. I'm happy to serve you any way I possibly can. My email, david.snyder at noaa.gov, is the easy way to find me. Now, as we look out across the weekend, uh, we are going to start watching for some wind to come up across parts of uh, eastern and southeast and some of the eastern Alaska range. It doesn't look like the winds are going to be terribly strong across a broad area for the Copper River Basin, but winds are going to come up a little bit, and they're certainly going to come up even more, maybe gust to about 45 miles per hour there across the eastern Alaska range as we head into tonight and into tomorrow. A wind advisory posted for the, uh, oh, looks like the tote cutoff in areas around Dun uh, Delta Junction. Uh, we do expect to see uh, some stronger gusts there throughout, uh, well, maybe as early as tonight and then onward into tomorrow. Of course, that will keep temperatures fairly mild across uh, the eastern interior in the upper Tanana Valley. And with that, it is a fire weather concern across some parts of the Copper River Valley. It doesn't look like it's going to be strong enough to warrant any type of fire weather alert or a watch right now. But as someone going out there into the Copper River Valley, Keep in mind, conditions are still tinderbox dry in many locations there. There has not been any beneficial rain, really, in uh, any great way. And humidity will be relatively low, and wind may be blustery at times. All those conditions set the stage for a very low end of, of fire danger as far as our thresholds go. Your threshold should be extreme caution. Uh, make sure that you're being extra careful no matter where you're going. If you're going out hunting, driving, or just uh, enjoying the weekend outside, as we hope you are, uh, make sure that you're careful with fire, and the Copper River Valley will be one of those places that you should use a little extra care and caution if you're out and about. Here's the drought monitor. We talked about this briefly yesterday, and there's been no change, but what I wanted to add to this was um, we don't know what drought impacts are really in South Central and Southwest because this is a new type of event for many of us here in Southern Alaska and Southwest for sure, and for that matter, Southeast. The impacts, the, the way that drought is being felt to you and what you're doing does matter. And so I wanted to offer something that I learned about today for the first time. The drought monitor folks have a way to categorize and learn about how you are being impacted by drought. So if you're in South Central, if you're in Southwest, if you're in Southeast, let these folks know. Say, you know, hey, I, I wasn't able to grow tomatoes this year or whatever it is you like to grow. Or, you know, the, the hay that I normally feed my cattle it wasn't available this year. Whatever that impact may be, our, our water has dried up, and we know that many villages are having water shortages. That's the kind of information these folks want. Droughtreporter.unl.edu slash map. That's droughtreporter.unl.edu slash map, and just click on that submit a report right there, and that'll walk you through how to do that. So, yeah, you probably need an internet connection. I haven't tried this on my phone to see if it works very well. But give it a shot if you have the time and the broadband uh, availability and connection. Please do that because that helps everybody from the state of Alaska to the National Weather Service, the hydrologists, and environmental monitors in your community do a better job when we start to see conditions like this shaping up. We know, hey, we need to start thinking about these things 
because that's what happened last time. And this is how we get to the last time categorizing uh, part of the problem here. So uh, do your part if you can. The citizen science is very important. Droughtreporter.unl.edu slash map. UNL is the University of uh, Nebraska Lincoln, if you're keeping track of that. All right, on into the forecast. Fire danger we know has not changed very much. We haven't had a whole lot of rain since we talked last time yesterday. Of course, across the Susitna Valley, the Western Kenai Peninsula, the Copper River Valley, and up the Glen Highway, and uh, up into the nooks and crannies there of the eastern Alaska Range, and still have some dry spots here around the Bristol Bay communities. Now, we're going to see plenty of rain, it looks like here, so chances are this is really kind of a non-issue, but for the Western Kenai, for the Copper River Valley, and the Susitna Valley, Matanuska Valley, yes, the fire danger remains high. Be careful with fire. As we look at the satellite picture from today, in the last six hours or so, you can see a healthy southerly flow. This will be pretty much the weekend event. High pressure sitting across the Gulf of Alaska. We've got a weak area of low pressure here that's kind of pulling away and just kind of grazing Hyder in some parts of southern and southeast with clouds and maybe a little bit of rain. But by and large, high pressure will be over southeast for the weekend. It is going to be slow roast kind of uh, weather for you. It looks like the, maybe today could be day one of three. Uh, for near record high temperatures, maybe even surpassing record highs there, temps in the 60s and 70s. Up north, you can see plenty of clouds reaching all the way to the Arctic coast, low pressure hovering across the west coast, and another wave coming in behind that. Let's roll that beautiful footage one more time, and you can see the spin of that circulation right here around St. Paul. A little bit of a break for our friends in Unalaska and Dutch Harbor, if you're there. Probably going to see a little bit of sunshine, uh, at least to end the day, and maybe a dry start tomorrow before the next round of clouds moves in. Here's a visible look, and you can see you're right there on the edge of that uh, open air there as you uh, look off to the south there, maybe toward Hawaii. You can see a little bit of blue sky. Hopefully that's the case. ADAC getting a little bit of a break, and then here comes that next round moving into Kiska and Shemya by late this afternoon. Across the Alcan border, some breaks in the clouds today. Not a bad day at all. Temperatures have been fairly mild, and clouds have been working their way back in across the Kenai Peninsula, Kodiak Island, and southwest. What we see south of Sand Point is a lot of convection, a lot of upward moving air, a lot of warm and wet air moving into the Alaska Peninsula. There's probably going to be some heavy rain. This is going to be very slow to move up the Alaska Peninsula coastline and into Kodiak, and the further east it goes, the intensity of that rain is going to start to go down, but we're probably not quite there just yet. High pressure sitting here uh, just north and east of Valdez and east of Cordova, west of Yakutat. It's holding back low pressure across the eastern Gulf. Some of that's slinging some rain into southern southeast. Low pressure outside of the Kuskokwim Delta near the Privlovs is going to be the main moisture pump, working with high pressure to draw in that south and easterly flow across Bristol Bay. A bumpy ride today if you're trying to fly through the bay and into uh, parts of Norton Sound where rain is moving further and further north as we go. Warmer air leaving the continent, moving into the Arctic there with that southerly flow, keeping things dry in the north slope, but clouds are certainly pretty uh, predominant across many parts of the Arctic coast. And a new low pressure system moving across the Aleutians tonight will help to develop a little bit of a break and some clearing across the central and eastern Aleutian chain tonight and into early tomorrow in the wake of the current weather system that will be moving up uh, the west coast as we through, uh, work through the overnight hours. The south wind again may bring some moderate to occasionally heavy rain around Kodiak. A lot of that is just going to graze the Kenai Fjords, maybe Homer, Shelikoff Strait, and uh, the Resurrection uh, Bay area as well as uh, the Barren Islands. And uh, that'll shoot a lot of that moisture up into Norton Sound, Nome, Deering, uh, Shishmaref, Kotzebue, all the way up in the uh, Chukchi Coast. High pressure keeps the eastern third of the state fairly dry and then some light rain and drizzle across extreme southern parts of southeast with areas of fog possible overnight across uh, some parts of the north and eastern gulf. As we get into Saturday, that should burn off quickly and looks like a very warm day for southeast. Low pressure sits north of Nunavak Island at 998 millibars. This front starts to fall apart. Showers make their way into western parts of Prince William Sound, maybe up some parts of Cook Inlet into the Susitna Valley, but by and large, uh, Anchorage, the Glen Highway, and many points east into the interior stay dry. Remember, we're going to have a breezy day across the eastern Alaska range, and a wind advisory has been posted. And low pressure working across the western chain at 998 millibars there uh, starts to swing a new front, rain, and uh, a little bit of wind probably from the south and southwest into the central chain. By Sunday, that's falling apart already, but sending some weather disturbances east into Bristol Bay. So we'll still keep some rain and clouds across the region, but you'll notice this upside down U-shaped pattern here, that's that ridge of high pressure. It's still holding on. It's still in control of the Gulf. And we still have a lot of clouds and a lot of wet, kind of dreary and drippy weather out across the west. And we still have some very dry weather across southeast. In fact, 
Again, we could still be talking about some record-setting heat across southeast as we wrap up the weekend. Here's a look at temperatures in the morning. 40s and 50s in southeast for southwest, lower 50s for you. St. Paul, 50 degrees. Bethel, 52. Uh, looks like Fairbanks around 42, mid 40s for the North Slope, 53 around Cottsview, South Central in the lower to mid 40s, one of the cooler spots around Talkeetna. Keaton. highs tomorrow there in the lower 60s, a low 70s possible for the interior and the middle Tanana Valley, lower 70s possible for northern southeast, the southern southeast probably cooler and in the 60s, southwest upper 50s, low 60s for you, Unalaska Nutch Harbor, 58 degrees, 55 around Atka. Overnight lows on Sunday, mid 40s for the interior, lower 40s for the north, southwest closer to 50, southeast in the lower 50s, south central in the mid 40s, and highs on Sunday warm again in the eastern interior near 70 degrees. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And on to your aviation weather for the week. And now as we start up Saturday morning, watch for widespread IFR across the Gulf. You'll also see a little possibility of that around the Hyder area as well as southern parts of the inside waters. And certainly along the outer coast, we're looking at marginal conditions there. So watch for some of that and some of that could be related to rain and certainly some areas of fog. It's high pressure still holding pretty tight across the western Yukon, northern parts of B.C and also south central. Now that is starting to give way and with that we're going to see more wind. We'll talk about the turbulence in a minute. But as far as the west go, most of the lowland areas there in the Capes are looking at IFR as well as areas around Kotzebue Sound and the uh, south facing slopes of the western Brooks Range and certainly the Chukchi Coast. On through the Bering and certainly the Aleutians. Uh, one bright spot could be around Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. It uh, looks like there is some potential for clearing to linger there at least late tonight and then that'll quickly start to fill in tomorrow morning, so marginal conditions will set, and by the afternoon, it could still hold around the region. Might even uh, get a little bit better there by the afternoon around uh, eastern parts of the chain, uh, towards Sand Point and the Shumigan Islands. And then for the southwestern capes, IFR is going to stick. So what you see is what you get for St. Paul, St. George, all the way up towards St. Matthew, uh, and uh, St. Lawrence Island, all looking to be socked in there through the Bering Strait. The Chukchi Coast, IFR, low conditions there, probably linger through the afternoon. But most of the Beaufort Sea Coast, most of the Brooks Range and your favorite passes there through the middle and upper Yukon Valley and the Copper River Valley, all looking to be generally VFR. And you'll see most of Southeast should be right there along with you. South Central probably looking at marginal conditions through the afternoon. A lot of that will hover right over the Chugach, uh, the Kenai Mountains, uh, and uh, really extend into the southern parts of the Susitna. But northern Susitna, maybe from Talkeetna eastward and into the uh, Glen Highway Corridor, probably looking to be okay VFR conditions there for Sunday morning some of that's really going to fill into IFR around the Chugach and certainly over Anchorage uh, Lake Hood all the way into the western Alaska range for Norton Sound St. Lawrence Island and south it does look to be fairly widespread IFR most of the Gulf is going to be IFR again and you'll notice that little patch that was around Hyder on Saturday morning is kind of extended now a little bit closer to Ketchikan and Annette north of that it looks pretty good uh, the North Slope looks to be IFR, at least on the Chuck Chi side, the Beaufort side, probably at least marginal conditions. And by the afternoon, really not a lot of change there. IFR through the Bering Strait and most of the west, uh, southwest looks to be VFR, and that's uh, MVFR, and that's spreading north and east. You'll notice IFR conditions now developing around Anchorage and the Susitna Valley up toward Big Lake and uh, probably Wasilla. And then most of the Gulf should be IFR. With southeast, though, still sitting pretty. And remember, record heat is possible there, so uh, conditions should be pretty good and certainly pretty warm. Your pass conditions for your Saturday, Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass expecting to see marginal conditions leaning over toward improving skies and visibility. VFR expected for both by the afternoon. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, marginal conditions most of the day. Rainy Pass, we expect to see marginal uh, conditions. Windy Pass, visual flight rules should hold. Same goes for Isabel Pass, Mentasta Pass, all the way through Tanita Pass. Portage Pass looks to be marginal generally to uh, the Prince William Sound side, the uh, western side, not too bad until late in the afternoon. And Chilgoot and White Pass expecting to call BFR for both places. Now, freezing levels show that broad area of heat just jumping well north, right along the Alcan border. Levels as high as 8,000 feet just south of Kaktovik, Nova Arctic Village. Uh, 10,000 feet from Eagle to Northway, all the way down toward Yakutat and the southeast. You can see levels there at or just below 10,000 feet. So this ridge is really impressive here, and it is going to be warm. 6 to about 8,000 feet across the western parts of uh, Alaska. And again, that broad southerly flow is sweeping right up the west coast, so it will be a little more unsettled out there. But as far as icing goes, those levels are high enough 
that icing is still not a major concern. We've got it drawn on the map here for your reference, but these levels are around nine to 10,000 feet. So it doesn't really look like we're going to have a significant icing concern for most places in most areas in Western Alaska or Southwest or the chain. So drawn on for your uh, viewing pleasure here, but uh, really not much of a concern right now. And the reason is a ridge of high pressure is really in charge of most of Alaska. So we have a broad southerly flow that's really punching through southwest. We're going to have turbulence today over Bristol Bay. Very warm conditions developing in the next two to three days over southeast. And as you see at 9,000 feet, southerly is coming in at 20 to 40 knots across the west coast. Uh, northerly flow uh, trying to set up here across southeast, but still very light. A southeasterly onshore flow really for the Alcan and for southeast, but with high pressure in charge to the east. A uh, broad sweeping flow across from southeast to northwest across south central Alaska could create some bumpy conditions through the weekend. Southwesterlies coming into uh, the southwestern coast and southerlies continue for most of the mainland. So turbulence concerns generally below three to about 5,000 feet for southwest, south central, and the chain as we go through Saturday and Sunday. Space weather affects technologies. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches to our customers so they can take action. The Space Weather Prediction Center has had a long-standing relationship with the power industry, so they've been aware that solar storms, the geomagnetic storm piece of that, can affect the operation of systems and induce extra currents and loads on those systems that can either trip those systems offline or, or in the worst of cases, cause damage. That relationship goes back for several decades, in fact. A big incident in 1989 where part of Quebec was tripped offline that affected something like six million customers for about nine hours. I think that really raised the awareness in the power industries. When we get the alert, we watch the grid and start looking for issues. Are we seeing a decline in voltage? Are we seeing equipment failures? And we readjust the system to try to mitigate those problems, try to keep the lights on and keep it from going out. So averaging about 500, 550 kilometers per second. If we didn't have this early warning, we wouldn't see it until our sensor saw it. Getting more information quicker and faster before the storm hits, not during the storm, is a big improvement. In the long term, I think what we need and what we're moving toward the U.S. as a whole is better modeling, fully understanding this phenomenon, understanding how it would impact specific systems. Rather than actually experiencing a storm, we can simulate storms in our software and see what the impact is. We try to get ahead of it. We always plan that if there's an outage, how can we keep the lights on? What's the best process to prevent it? In the end, five, ten years from now, there's going to be a whole mix of operational procedures driven by what we do on prediction and warning, and then there also will probably be some level of hardware controls to ensure the reliability of the grid. Space weather affects technologies. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches to our customers so they can take action. There's different types of impacts on communication systems. And the HF, we call the high frequency, which is that band of communications, 3 to 30 megahertz. But it's a very important band of radio communication because it's used widespread. It's used, for example, by the airlines. HF radio is most commonly used for position reporting when you're going across the ocean airspace, which is devoid of, of radar. And, and ATC can't see you, so you're, it's up to you to report your position and your altitude and your speed. HF works great most of the time, except during a big flare. 
I joined Big Flare that HF communication capability would be gone within a minute or two. So as soon as we see something happening in there, or we see a flare, it's one of the first things we do is alert the aviation community, hey, big flare, HF's gonna be impacted. Once we know that there's an event going on, then the aviation industry and the airlines can react to that. They can alter their routes over the poles. They can lower the altitudes that they're flying at, or maybe decide not to fly at all in the interest of their passenger safety. So that's just one example of how EHF is used, but the emergency response community will use it a lot too. It's one of the primary backups. When you've lost connectivity between certain government agencies, it gives you that long-range coverage to talk from out of state to federal governments or from the FEMA locations to the state uh, emergency operations centers. So if you've got a big hurricane impact in the coastline, whatever big city, uh, we've got the cell towers down and whatnot, we've got emergency communication folks in there. Those folks are very familiar with space weather and how it impacts their systems. Here in recent years, it was used during Katrina when we had a lot of communications outages down there. It was also used during Hurricane Ike. There was an outage of the telephone circuits with the Texas State Emergency Office, so it was used in both of those situations. So when we talk about backup, especially for the airlines, typically they'll have SATCOM, so it'll be satellite communication. The satellite technology that emergency responders use could be GPSs, could be satellite phones, satellite data terminals. Space weather events can impact SATCOMs. The impact can range from a nuisance to loss of a spacecraft. So we will give them the heads up. If we have space weather events, flares, whatnot, they need to know what's impacting their systems. Situational awareness is key. Time is of essence to these folks. Again, it's life and death. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And back with a look at your sea ice edge, you'll notice that the pack ice really hasn't moved a whole lot. We were talking about some marginal ice uh, just kind of coming into view here out of the Canadian waters. That is nothing substantial. It's just uh, some marginal ice that's been rotating around in the Beaufort Gyre, but we are not seeing any growth along the Alaska waters at all, and certainly not north. Uh, the pack ice now extends. Uh, about 300, 350 nautical miles north of Utkiavik, so um, a substantial distance between uh, any significant ice and the Alaska coastline. As we look at Saturday in southeast, it promises to be a warm day, and part of that is the very light winds, uh, no major push of cold or warm air moving through, and you'll have a plenty of sunshine there. It looks like 5 to 10 knot winds in all areas for Saturday in southeast. A light northwesterly flow in the inside passage, only two footsies expected there. And an offshore wind for the outer coast, maybe three foot seas, but still five to ten knot winds on Saturday. Not a big change for Sunday at all. North and westerly winds coming down the outer coast, ten knots with three foot seas, maybe four foot seas outside of Yakutat. And then across the Lynn Canal, all the way down through Stevens Passage and Clarence Strait, Petersburg, Ketchikan, Metlakatla, looking very nice. Light winds, ten knots, two foot seas, maybe some cloud cover across southern parts of the southeast, but the northern two thirds, central and northern parts of the panhandle, look to be pretty warm through the weekend. Northeasterlies north will be fairly light across Prince William Sound. Ten knots and three-foot seas there. Gusty winds, though, coming down Cook Inlet for Saturday, up to 35 knots in the northern parts of Cook Inlet. Once you get south of Kenai, the gusts won't be quite as prevalent. Uh, 25 to 30 knots there as you get into Kamishak and Kashimak Bay. Seven to 13-foot seas uh, just outside of those waters. Uh, east and southeasterly flow flowing into Kenai Fjords and the eastern barrens. 30 knots with an 8 to 10-foot sea on Saturday. For Sunday, winds diminish in all areas, and we're looking at more of a southerly flow returning to Cook Inlet. Light winds in the northern parts now, and the windiest spots will be in the western barrens, 20 knots and 5-foot seas, and northwesterlies coming out of Prince William Sound, 10 to 15, looking for 6 to 7-foot seas on the outside. On the inside, still two-footers there for Prince William Sound. Saturday, uh, inside of Bristol Bay, 25 knots with a 7-foot sea. The seas will be a little bit higher as you move south and east of the Pribilovs. You're looking for 9-foot seas north of Cold Bay. 
and uh, 30 knot winds there are responsible for some of that with that southwesterly flow ahead of low pressure that's uh, still working its way into western Alaska. On the south side of that in the Alaska Peninsula, 20 knots with 10 to 11 foot seas, 5 foot seas with an east flow off of Kodiak Island through Shelikov Strait. 20 knots still there on uh, Sunday. Not a big change, more of a southerly flow though. You notice the west and southwesterly still working at the Pacific waters. For Bristol Bay, 20 to 25, you're looking at about 6 to 7 foot seas. And there's some higher seas off to the south and west, but a lot of this is going to diminish as we get into Monday. Remember, there's a second weather system. We'll look at that here in just a second. Here's the Aleutians on Saturday. A south and westerly flow working across the central and eastern chain, 25 to 30 really in all areas. But you'll notice the air already curving back into the western Aleutians. That's that second weather system that's working in south of the chain. And the first one's already worked up the west coast. So uh, the west and southwesterly winds are being pulled into that. Seven to nine foot seas for the central and eastern chain of the Bering Sea coast and anywhere from nine to 12 foot seas across the Pacific waters. That improves a lot on Sunday. Westerlies coming across the Bering Sea coast, southerlies for Unalaska, Dutch Harbor, and all the way down toward the Pacific waters, 25 knots or so. 12 foot seas on the Pacific coastline, anywhere from five to seven foot seas for the Bering and light winds out in the west as that second weather system is moving through. Now out across the west coast on Saturday, southwest onshore flow into the Kuskokwim Delta, 25 knots and 7 foot seas, 8 foot seas for St. Paul and St. George, and an east and northerly flow really wrapping into low pressure as it's working into uh, places like McCorriac and Nunavak Island. You'll notice the southwesterly onshore flow from Hooper Bay all the way down toward the Delta again. That's responsible uh, for that flow. As we get into Sunday, southerlies are working through the region as low pressure is shifting northward and the front is kind of falling apart. And it's already passed, but it will be falling apart inland at this point. Uh, northerly wind for St. Matthew. Uh, southerlies continue for St. Paul and St. George with a 5 to 6 foot sea in the region and 6 footers around St. Lawrence Island and Norton Sound with a 30 knot wind coming ashore in the Nome. For the north slope, southerlies offshore, 10 knots, 2 foot seas, south and easterly flow across the Chukchi coast, 20 knots and 4 foot seas for you on Saturday. Light winds and small seas for the Beaufort Sea coast as we get into Sunday and a southeasterly flow, 15 to 20 with three to four footers on Sunday coming out of Kotzebue Sound. A quick recap of tonight's weather. High pressures in command of the eastern Gulf and southeast in the Copper River Valley for tonight. Winds are going to start to pick up across the eastern Alaska range and low pressures moving into the west coast and that'll keep a lot of the rain focused on south central's highlands and out toward the west, Bristol Bay, Kodiak Island and up the west coast for Saturday with another weather system behind it. Winds and uh, gusts 45 knots across the eastern Alaska range for tomorrow. <laughs> These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.